Today's video is a mega video and a bit of a deep dive on the Ars Goetia. It will combine four of my previous videos, though I'll also be adding in more information, particularly about the real-life history of the Ars Goetia, so even returning viewers will get something new. Now, in the show, there are two forms of royalty. The first and most important are the Seven Princes of Hell, each ruling over their own ring. Lucifer serves as the leader of this group, and as such, he's the king of all of hell, in addition to being the prince of the pride ring, with the other princes having more or less total control over their own rings, as long as they at least pretend to bow down to Lucifer. The only other prince we have seen is Osmodius, who is not just a prince of the seven rings, but is also a king in the Ars Goetia. The Ars Goetia are a secondary form of royalty made up of 72 nobles who seem to be subservient to the Seven Princes, as well as be working for them. With that in mind, being a king, the highest rank in the Ars Goetia is not as high status as being a prince in the Seven Rings. In the show, the only Ars Goetia members we know of so far are of course Stolas, his father Paimon, his brother-in-law Andreelfis, and of course Osmodius. Paimon and Osmodius are just two of nine kings, with below them there being the dukes, then the princes like Stolas, marquis like Andreelfis, and earls, knights, and presidents making up the lower ranks. Stella and Andreelfis are siblings, but look very different because they are peacock-based demons. Male peacocks are known for their vibrant green and blue colors to attract females, but the females themselves are generally just off-white and plain-looking. In addition to there being seven rings of hell stacked on top of each other, we also see on Imp City's sign that it is the second circle of hell. This is a reference to Dante's Divine Comedy, where hell is described as having nine circles, as opposed to the seven rings in the show. These circles, instead of being stacked on top of each other, are circular territories that I believe to be limited to the pride ring. It has been confirmed that the first circle of hell is of course Pentagram City, which itself sits under a giant floating circled pentagram. Paimon's and later Stolas's castles seem to be built to rule over Imp City, leading me to believe that each of the nine kings rule over one circle in the pride ring, with the dukes, princes, marquis, and such helping to rule those territories beneath them, as well as contributing to the larger Goetia goals. This would explain why so much of the Goetia seems to be clustered in the Pride Ring so far. That being said, Osmodius is also the Prince of the Lust Ring as explained earlier, so while he may rule over both territories, the Circles and Ars Goetia may be unrelated. Osmodius so far is the only overlap between the royalty of the Seven Princes and the Ars Goetia that we know of, however, one of the nine kings serving next to Paimon and Osmodius in the Ars Goetia is Bael, the same rank of course as Stolas' father, King Paimon. Bael dates back to the Old Testament itself where he is depicted as a false god in the Levant. Fans of Hell of a Boss are likely also aware of Beelzebub, known in the Peter Binsfield classification to be the Prince of the Gluttony Ring, though Moxie refers to him as a she, so she may be a princess. Regardless, depictions of Beelzebub are actually derived from Bael, making them the same entity in some demonologies, though distinct from each other and others who are unaware of their original connections. While they may be different demons in the show, it is possible that, like Osmodius, Beelzebub is a prince of a ring, but also a king in the Ars Goetia. These characters are all inspired by the real-life writings of the Lesser Key of Solomon, which describes the Ars Goetia as well as how to summon them and use their powers. The Lesser Key of Solomon itself is dated back to the 1600s, and is inspired by the Pseudomonarchia Daemonum from a century before. These were just two of many grimoires at the time. These grimoires would evolve and change, introducing the seals to summon these demons that decorate the castles that we see in the show, and can be used by humans to summon demons in the show, as seen in episode 6, when Stolas forces some dead agents to do the ritual so he could force his way to Earth without his grimoire. Most of these grimoires were themselves heavily referencing earlier documents and mythologies going back some time as well, with most of these grimoires claiming that the original source of this information is King Solomon, from legends saying he used the demons to construct his temple in 900 BC. There is no evidence he did write on these particular demons, however, nor is there any mention of him using demons to construct his temple in the Bible, which is explained in quite a bit detail there. The Lesser Key of Solomon and other grimoires like it are attributed to him the same way that most books of the Bible are attributed to a certain author that were not actually written by them, but instead are used as a sort of call of authority to make it seem more believable. 
Helping with this was the fact that some of the demons named in the Ars Goetia had earlier roots in the Abrahamic religions, such as Asmodeus himself, who is well known from a secondary canon Jewish text called the Book of Tobit, believed to date back to 200 BC. Other demons such as Stolas and even Paimon, however, don't have as much history behind them, with the earliest mention of both of them that I could find being these demonic grimoires from the last millennium, as opposed to mentions in the Bible or other texts of that time. Baalzebub in particular dates all the way back to the Old Testament, where it is the demonized name of another god worshipped in the Levant, originally Baal, as I explained before. In the show, the Ars Goetia have been shown to be almost entirely bird-themed, but this is not the case in the actual real-life Lesser Key of Solomon, where they take on a multitude of different forms, all being different from each other, ranging from human to animalistic. Stolas is described as an owl wearing a crown in the text, inspiring his design in the show, and designing the rest of the Ars Goetia became about building it around Stolas in that regard. Andrealfis is a peacock-based demon, which itself is something mentioned in the Ars Goetia. Osmodius, on the other hand, has a more complicated story for his design. Osmodius is described in the Ars Goetia as having three heads, one of a man, a bull, and a ram, but nothing about being bird-like. These inspired his design in the show, where he has those three heads as three faces. Outside of that, his design is mostly rooster-like, something likely inspired by his later depictions in books like the Dictionnaire Inferno, which described him as having the legs, or even just one leg, of a rooster. This has allowed them to maintain the bird theme with great authenticity so far. However, Paimon, Stolas' father, is not depicted as an owl-based demon in the Lesser Key of Solomon, or as a bird anywhere else that I could find. He's mostly depicted as being a very pretty man, sometimes riding a camel. Of course, in the show when we first meet Paimon, we see him taking on several forms, with non-bird animals in the mix, before becoming an owl. When he talks to Stolas, he is unsure of his name, but knows him by his species and rank, indicating that the many other children he alludes to may be different species as well. At Stolas's party, we mostly see them depicted as birds, however, like Osmodius, they may have a bird appearance, but also inspirations, transformations, or hidden aspects that more resemble their depictions in the Lesser Key of Solomon, as well as other demon texts. All of this being something of a form given to them by their demonic fathers and whatever form they assume to birth and interact with the children. Like Paimon, I imagine the other kings, perhaps even Osmodius, take on many different forms in order to populate the lower ranks of the Ars Goetia, leading to the birth of Stolas, Andrealfis, and the others like them. That being said, it may be something Paimon in particular is responsible for, or just a few kings, and Asmodeus may have no children to speak of, with royal titles or not. Paimon is introduced in the show as the father of Stolas, though he is not the father of Stolas in any real-life writings on demonology that I have come across. Stella is said to be a member of the Ars Goetia as well, however, she is not any demon described in any demonic text, nor is Stella and Stolas' daughter Octavia, and the Ars Goetia as a whole seem to have a complex family tree branching off from the 72 roles in the real-life text. The confirmed Goetic kings of the show, Paimon and Osmodia, seem to have a particular interest in Earth. While Osmodius is happy to rule over his clubs and lust, even stars like Veraska and her succubus posse are sent him to Earth in order to entice humans and spread STDs, according to a joke from Blitz. This is so common that Osmodius has created Osmodian crystals specifically to give his succubus easy access up to Earth, whereas Blitz had to steal an elite's grimoire to start his business. Paimon, likewise, is really focused on the prophecies and the stars surrounding Earth and utilizing the Earth for their own benefit. Back in the pilot, Stolas even talks about how he wants Splits to assassinate someone that is trying to convince people that global warming exists. This would lead to less awareness about global warming, less being done about it, a harsher climate, more reasons to turn to vice and sin as resources become more scarce, and the eventual more souls in hell after they die because of it. Paimon is said to be the most loyal of the Goetic kings to Lucifer in particular, who himself is very interested in owning and corrupting God's creation. Some other deadly princes such as Satan may have interest in Earth as well, probably influencing wars on Earth, but others like Mammon seem more interested in exploiting the local residents of Hell for their own sinful gain, who seems to just want to make as much money as possible regardless of how it negatively impacts imps and other natives. 
Even down in the sloth ring, we have Belphegor, who according to legend, actually rebelled because he simply did not want to work, so I doubt he'd be interested in working hard to conquer the Earth. Instead, it seems that this is largely driven by Lucifer and those who follow him, which seems to include the Goetic Demons. Because of this, I think the primary goal of the kings is to rule over Earth itself, with some of the princes of the rings involved in the takeover having dual territories on Earth and in Hell after its completion. The Goetic Demons may not just serve Lucifer, however, and don't seem to only serve to conquer Earth, but instead do get involved with the local happenings of Hell as well, as evidenced by Stolas doing rituals to curse the crops at the Harvest Moon Festival. But all of this seems to be done to maintain the population before creating Hell on Earth as part of their eventual endgame. Stolas had to start his job pretty early on, and study a lot about Earth leading up to it. His primary focus, according to Paimon, was learning about the stars and their prophecies. With the Grimoire, he has access to the human realm, but only seems to need it once a month for a full moon ritual he does. We also know that once a year, he needs it for the aforementioned Harvest Moon Festival, and I presume there are a few other events in the year that happened off-screen that he would need it for, or perhaps other events that happen only here and there, or once in a few years. Stolas' job is to study the stars surrounding the Earth and to uncover the prophecies there. When not doing his rituals, I imagine a large amount of his time was spent just studying the constellations and writing down what they could mean. This reflects the real-life practice of ancient cultures trying to use the stars to decode the mysteries of life and the universe. In fact, in the real-life Ars Goetia, Stolas is described as a demon you summon to help learn more about the stars and what they mean for the future of our world. The Ars Goetia wants to uncover these prophecies, likely to see if they will be successful in taking over the world and eventually defeating heaven in the battles of apocalyptic myth and legend. In the most recent episode, we see Stolas open his grimoire one morning, some constellations bubble out, and he puts it back away, giving up almost immediately. He doesn't look confused per se, but just not seemingly making any more progress than he has in a long time. According to his song in episode 2, he seemed pretty confident in his star-based predictions, but was caught off guard by one event that seemed to be time with the birth of his daughter Octavia. He describes it as an eclipse-like event, the sun going black, but in the background we see a star not being eclipsed, but dying entirely after the planets are absorbed into it. Regardless of what the event was, it was an astronomical event Stolas did not see coming, and one that coincided with the birth of his daughter, who has eyes that shine like a star, which Stolas describes as her stealing from the star when it went black. From here, Stolas seems to have only become more confused. In the song, he alludes to perhaps the end of hell and even all of creation, but somehow Octavia being safe from it all, even if Stolas himself is not. I've theorized quite a bit in the past that I would not be surprised if this apocalyptic event actually requires Stolas to give his life, but it would maintain that Octavia is okay, and in the end, that is what matters most to Stolas. That being said, it isn't good information to bring back to the kings of the Ars Goetia, or anyone for that matter. All he knows is that his daughter will be safe, even if creation ends, but that hell may collapse entirely in the final battles. Without even having any specifics on this, it would only frustrate the Ars Goetia more and make them hate Stolas for not having answers on how to at least fix it. Instead, I think Stolas has been underreporting since Octavia was born, still frustrating his father and the higher ups, but not as much as revealing that hell may be doomed to fail and taking over the earth with no solid way to get out of it. For 18 years then, Stolas would have been digging himself into a deeper and deeper hole, failing at his duties while perhaps other goetic demons thrive. Stolas is a prince, so is pretty high ranking, but he is not the only one written about in the Lesser Key of Solomon who studies astronomy. Stella's brother Andrielphus does this as well, though he is only a marquis, which is of lower rank than a prince like Stolas. He likely studies other aspects of the stars and their prophecies, but none as important as Stolas's. While Stolas is lagging behind, Andrielphus may see it as a way to get a promotion by taking Stolas' job, but with Octavia being the cautionary heir to Stolas' position, that could get dark really quick. Andrielphus was a character who first appeared in the storyboard trailer for Season 2. In the trailer, many fans, myself included, believed it to be Epos, an Ars Goetia demon, a prince like Stolas, who can see the future and is described as goose-like. We later, however, got concept art for the character with their name revealed to be Andrielphus, a marquis in the Ars Goetia, described as being a peacock, and was revealed to be Stolas' brother-in-law. For those who didn't see this, Stella brings him up at the end of Season 2, Episode 1, as a sort of threat against Stolas, with the intent being that we will see him expanded upon in a future episode. 
Stolas as a prince is outranked by kings like Paimon and Osmodius, as well as dukes, though no dukes have appeared in the show so far. Stella's brother Andrielfis is a marquis, which is roughly in the middle of the Ars Goetia, making him important, but not as important as Stolas. It raises the question of why Stella would bring him up as a threat. In the conversation, Andrielfis and Stella are depicted as being close, and kind of a bit of a team against the harsh life that is the Goetia royalty. I imagine he is quick to defend his sister, and like her, is more or less just waiting for opportunities to attack people. As a Marquis, why would he be such a threat to a prince like Stolas, though? The first theory I saw floating around was that Andrielfis may be in charge of the angelic weapons market, and or have his hand in the assassinations market, which would greatly require them. While Stella is rich enough that she could probably just buy a few angelic weapons to give to Stryker as payment, she may have needed to go through a connection like her brother, as Moxie indicates that it's pretty hard to get your hands on in Episode 5. Other theories include him just being in good standing with other members of the Ars Goetia, and thus being capable of gossiping Stolas into oblivion among his own ranks. Stolas already had quite the scandal sleeping with an imp like Blitz, and even divorcing Stella after all of this seems to be something that could have dire consequences for him socially, despite Stolas seeming confident that he will survive it all. With more rumors coming from Stella, Andrielfis could sabotage Stolas and perhaps even get him in trouble with his father Paimon. As a Marquis and Stella's brother, Andrielfis is likely the child of one of the kings or dukes in the Ars Goetia as well. While he may not outrank Stolas, he may be in much better standing with his own parents than Stolas. Stolas. Stolas and Stella's marriage is arranged, so their parents may themselves be on pretty great terms, and Paimon could be very embarrassed by what Stolas has been doing with imps, and beyond that, how Stolas may have been falling behind with his other goetic duties. Andreofis, meanwhile, may have less important duties in the Ars Goetia, but may be making better progress with them than Stolas. In addition to Stolas' scandal of sleeping with an imp, and now trying to divorce Stella, Stolas could be falling out of favor with the other goetic demons, who might be happy to promote Andreofis to Stolas' position if it was not something that he had unfortunately inherited. If something were to happen to Stolas, however, then Andrielfis could be seen as a reasonable demon to promote to Stolas' duties and take over things like the full moon ritual that Stolas is required for when not doing his interpretations of prophecies. If Stella is able to get her hands on angelic weapons and an assassin like Stryker, I don't imagine it would be out of reach for Andrielfis, especially if the theories are true and he has his hands involved in those markets. Over time, there could be so many assassins on the lookout for Stolas that he could never be safe in any ring of hell, even with Blitz and the others guarding him. While Stolas has proven that he can handle any old assassin who comes at him with a regular weapon, he'd have a hard time stopping more killers like Stryker coming after him everywhere he goes or anywhere he tries to hide. The problem with this theory is that Octavia is the precautionary heir, as Paimon put so plainly, meant to take over the throne if anything were to happen to Stolas. I had theorized previously that this would not be a permanent installment, as Stolas may perhaps be reborn again and raised to take over their role, but that's just a theory from one of my earlier videos. For now, Octavia does not have the experience to take over the throne, and thus Andrielfis could take over temporarily if something bad were to happen to Stolas. That being said, he may see Octavia as a threat to his power either way, someone who would just take over his role in some time when she aged into the position. As such, his best option becomes hiring an assassin to take out Octavia too. Now, it's been indicated that Andrielfis and Stella are close, and it can be hard to imagine him wanting to assassinate his own niece, but after seeing how undeniably evil Stella is, I don't think it's out of the question for him to be even more so. Stella may get a backstory where we learn the nuance for her trauma, but until then, she is what she says, someone who just loves to torment Stolas. Stolas knows this so well that he believes she wasn't even hurt by his sleeping with an imp, and instead is just using it as another reason to attack him. This would mean that her having him assassinated may even be something she started working on before learning about Stolas's infidelity, and instead may have been thinking about it for some time. This may have just been the event that made her pull the trigger, so to speak, and hire Stryker. Stryker himself is less interested in getting paid, it seems, and instead wanted the access to angelic weapons he could get. While Stella was the one to pay him for the job, he indicates to Blitz that his goals are way bigger than just Stolas, and killing him is just a bonus in addition to getting the guns that he says he wants to use on more demon royalty. 
There is no reason he would find it wrong to go after Octavia, she's just another Goetic demon. And if not him, Andreolfus may have access to any number of assassins and other crime doers in his ranks that could get the job done as well. This would be a huge betrayal to Stella, and perhaps one that knocks some sense into her over all the crazy problems she is causing by trying to have the father of her own daughter assassinated. So the first time I pitched this idea, I thought showcasing Andreolfus as the bad guy and Stella getting a chance to make things right was the only way it would seem believable, but the general response in the comments was that most of you think Stella would have Octavia killed just to get back at Stolas. Regardless, if someone like Stryker were to go after Octavia, it would certainly raise the stakes about as high as they can go, especially if Octavia's fate is in some way connected to an apocalyptic prophecy as discussed before. But what do you guys think? Did you enjoy this mega video, if you even made it this far, and would you like to see more of them? I was thinking of combining my videos surrounding the lore of Lucifer and Satan to one mega video that would have a lot of real life history added in. Leave your thoughts in the comments down below, and while you're down there, consider Consider using the Discord link in the pinned comment to join my Hasman Lore Discord server. See you guys there!